Anything you need on my end or um, you will? No, I'm just going to open I'll just up. Put, I'll just put, um, you need, you want, um, you need control or you want to just put the spotlight video or um, however it's. Yeah, you know what, let me, um, one second. Let me just pull up the, uh, I just exported the PowerPoint. Sometimes I find it works better as a PDF with Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, shut down everything else. <laughs> And as I'm shutting everything down, I would suggest everybody else shut everything down and just grab a pen because we're going to cover a lot and I'm going to go fairly quickly. Usually I do this presentation in like 90 minutes and I smash it down to an hour. So we got time for plenty of questions. So uh, we're going to go fairly quickly. All right, so let me share. <clears throat> See if I can make this full screen. There we go. Can you guys see that? Yep. Dwayne, are you seeing that on your end? Yep, looks good. Yep. Okay, cool. All right, guys. So tonight's theme is how I scaled my Airbnb side hustle to retire my wife, myself, and my mom without owning or leasing any property over the last 18 months. Uh, the first and foremost thing that I want to reiterate is that your time is valuable. Okay. The biggest lesson that I have learned in my life, and I'll share some of my story in a minute, but time is way more valuable than money. Like money's easy guys. Like I'm going to show you guys how to make plenty of money. You know, Dwayne, he's doing some, a lot of cool stuff with real estate. Like money's easy, but you can never get your time back. So I appreciate you guys being here. I want to give you guys as much value as possible. So I just ask like, be present with me, give me 60 minutes. And I promise you, I'm going to give you as much actionable content as possible. So let's like dial this thing in and uh, get right into it. So my goal from this training tonight is for those of you guys that have full-time jobs, maybe you're on the fence, maybe you're just getting started with real estate. I want to teach you, oops, I'm just going to mute or maybe. Oh, I think I, I, do, I do it online, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so for those of you guys that have full-time jobs, there we go. Mute. Unmute myself. Okay, cool. So everybody else stay on mute. I promise we will get to questions at the end. So any questions you have, just jot them down and I will make sure to answer everybody's questions at the end. Uh, the goal from this training is for those of you guys that have full-time jobs, you're going to learn how to generate income every single month on sites like Airbnb without owning or leasing any properties while working a full-time job. Okay. I did this for two and a half years while working a full-time job with a three-year-old and a wife and another side hustle. So this is totally doable if you have a full-time job. For those of you guys that already own rental properties, I wanna show you how to two to five X the income on those rentals simply by changing the model and running them as short-term rentals. So who am I? Again, my name's Mike Shogren. Uh, Dwayne and I met a few months back at a meetup. Uh, I've been, you know, I kind of coined myself as the Airbnb guy. This is all I do, this is my full-time thing. Uh, this is my niche. Um, you know, I give talks all over the place. This was from a presentation I gave in Canada and I'm just super passionate about sharing this because I wish I learned how to do this stuff, you know, even before I did. So I've been featured on Joe Fairless's podcast a couple of times. I've been on Whitney's syndication show, uh, Neil's road to financial freedom. Uh, I've been on Jake and Gino. I've been on pretty much every podcast out there, um, except bigger pockets. That one will be coming in 2020 but I've pretty much gotten on the majority of the real estate podcasts. I've been on Dwayne's show. Um, this is a screenshot from one of my six Airbnb accounts from 2019. I just grabbed that before we got started. Uh, I actually need to update that. We're at like 465 star reviews now. Um, we currently operate in five different states. We're in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, North Carolina, Florida, and Texas as of last month. But that stuff's all, it all sounds cool. It all sounds exciting, but I want to come back to like why I actually started this business. 
So I'm sure like many of you, I was told, all right, kid, go to school, get good grades, get a good job, put 10% in a 401k, and then magically someday you're going to live a good life when you're 65. And I bought into that for the first 10 years of my career, right? I went to school, I got good grades, I got a job as an accountant. You know, by all people on the outside looking in, you know, I had a good normal life. Um, you know, I had a house, a couple cars, wife, kid, all that. Um, until one day, I, you know, my wife and I, our son was born and he had a rare uh, lung disease called interstitial lung disease. And for the first 18 months of his life, he had to be on oxygen. And we spent a ton of time at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, folks there were amazing. We're blessed to live so close. But uh, I'll never forget, we had been there at one point for three weeks straight. He was doing all, this, all these tests and going through all this stuff. It was a really scary time. And uh, this horrible feeling came over me that we'd been there three weeks. I was all out of vacation time. I was all out of sick time. I had all these hospital bills piling up. And I had to leave my wife and my son in the hospital because I need to go back to a cubicle and trade time for money. And some of you guys, I see, you know, you got kids like that was as a man, as a father and a husband, like that was the worst pain I had ever felt in my life. And it was the greatest gift because it gave me the biggest kick in the butt that I could have ever gotten. And in that moment, I said, I will never put my family in this situation again. I will find a way to build a business where I do not need to trade my time for money, period. And uh, it just lit this fire under me. And over the next 12 months after that, I just started researching, you know, really going deep, trying to figure out everything I could about real estate investing, rental properties. And through a mastermind group that I was in, I stumbled across this niche around short-term rentals. And I met a gentleman who was telling me, you know, he was normally on a rental property, you might net, you know, two to 300 bucks a month, maybe 400 if you're lucky. You know, this gentleman was netting anywhere from a thousand to 2000 bucks a month and he didn't even own the property. And when he, he basically showed me his numbers, showed me the operation, I was like, this looks amazing. So I went to my wife and I was like, all right, this is what we're gonna do, this sounds amazing. And she said, all right, we'll do this under one condition. And that is, um, if we go this route, we're gonna buy a property and we're gonna use it every single month as a family, no matter what. And I said, all right, deal. And since we made that promise to each other two, a little over two years ago, we purchased this condo. I'll show you guys in a minute up in the mountains in New Hampshire. It's, I love it. It's like my serenity. Uh, every single month we've gone up there and use it as a family. And every single month that thing pumps out anywhere from a thousand to 1500 bucks a month cash flow. Like after paying the mortgage, expenses, cleaners, supplies, you name it, it puts a thousand to 1500 bucks a month in my pocket from that one property. So for me, I'm going to get into like how I learned how to scale that because at that point I put all my cash into that deal. But what I want to understand is how do I reach financial freedom? At that point I was sold on the business, but let's like actually define it because so many people say like, I want to be financially free. And then when I ask them like, well, what does that mean? Definition is, is the ability to fund your lifestyle without trading time for money. That's my definition. So step number one is what's your number? How many people on this call right now, if I asked you, what is your number? You could tell me immediately. How much do you need to make from real estate to quit your job or fund your lifestyle? That is step number one. Like you have got to know that's the target. If you don't know where you're going, I don't care if it's Airbnbs, rentals, flipping, wholesaling. I don't care. You're not going to get there because you don't know what your target is. So first step, know, know what your number is. Then where are you now? Like, are you generating any passive income right now? It's a simple question. Figure out, am I generating anything? And then step three is choose your path. Now, I would highly suggest that you stick to one vehicle or one niche Two max if you're feeling dicey and crazy. But this whole thing took off for me when I, I chose one niche. I said, I am going to just focus on short-term rentals. And then it all took off. But the old way, okay, this is what, again, we're taught all that stuff in school. And then I started learning real estate. It's like, okay, just work hard, save 10%, buy a rental property. You'll make about a 12% cash on cash return. Burr it refi, whatever, and you repeat. And you keep doing that over and over again. 
And it absolutely works. Like you can absolutely get financially free doing that. The problem is it takes a long freaking time with your own money to do that, unless you've got deep pockets. Okay, with short-term rentals, this is a place that we bought in New Hampshire. This is the view off of our deck. And my wife and my son hanging out, playing back there, going sledding. But there's this gap, right, of where you are and where you wanna go. I feel like these slides got all out of whack, by the way, when I exported them. But we're gonna uh, roll with it anyway. Can anyone see? I don't. I still see your your home, like the first page. Oh, really? You guys aren't even seeing the slides that I've been showing? Nah. Oh, see, this is not good. Well, let's okay, let's hit the there, reset there button go. real quick, and maybe I'll have to. Oh, you're seeing now, it now? Yeah, now I see it now. Yeah, I can see your mouse moving. Okay. Kind oh of man, so you guys, you guys missed my little dude over here. Uh, that was like the punchline right there. But um, let's keep going. All right. Oh, there you go. We, we was all we was all tied into what you were saying, but we couldn't see. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, good. Well, hopefully you could at least see my face. <laughs> uh, so this is the place that we bought in New Hampshire. This is the view off of our deck. I freaking love it. It's just a little two bedroom condo in a four unit building. Um, but the views are amazing. It's up by North Conway. If you, for those of you guys that know that area up by like Storyland, a bunch of ski resorts. Uh, it's my, it's my serenity. I, I love going up there. Uh, it's my wife and my son hanging out, but for most of us, right, there's this gap and we're just trying to figure out how to close this gap. And I knew that the model worked. I had proven it, but I put all my cash. Like I took a loan out of my 401k for the down payment and the reno on that on that property. So at this point, I don't have any cash. I had all those hospital bills that I was paying off. I, I wasn't flush with cash. So I said, how else could I scale this business? And, you know, somebody was teaching me about, oh, you can master lease properties and then you basically make the spread, which you can do. But I didn't even have enough for first month's rent, last month's rent and furniture. Like I was pretty much broke at that point and I couldn't live off of 1500 bucks a month. And then I came across this quote from Rockefeller. It said, own nothing, but control everything. And it just got my juices thinking. I'm like, all right, well, how do I control more assets if I can't afford to own them? And so basically, and again, if you look at any of the unicorns out there, the Amazons, the Ubers, the Facebooks, the Airbnbs, Amazon, the largest retailer, owns no retail. Uber, the largest taxi service, owns no taxis. Facebook, the largest media company, owns no media. Airbnb, the largest hospitality company in the world, owns no property. So if all the unicorns are doing it, maybe I should take a, a page out of their playbook, right? So tonight, this is what we're going to cover. How to fast track financial freedom using Airbnb without owning a single property. How to profit on Airbnb even if you don't live in a big city or a vacation town and how you can run a massively profitable short-term rental business in less than four hours a week. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Good. So there are three ways to create income with short-term rentals. Okay. You can own it, you can master lease it, or you can co-host it or essentially manage it for somebody else. Okay. So how does this co-hosting model work? Okay. You essentially partner with landlords that have vacant properties and you run the property as a short-term rental and you split the profit. So I go to Dwayne and I say, hey, Dwayne, you're, you're looking to rent out your two-bedroom apartment for 1500 bucks a month. If you pay to furnish it, I'll tell you exactly what to put in there. I'll design it for you. You just pay for it. I'll run it. What if I could get you 2000 to 2500 a month instead? Is that something that you'd be interested in? And that's essentially the conversation that we have. Okay, so for you, you don't have any, as the operator, I don't have any down payments, I don't have any mortgages, I don't have any leases, I have zero cash invested in these deals. But why would they do that? Because you can two to five X the income running it as a short-term rental all day. Okay, I like to use the analogy, and again, I'm from Boston, so don't get offended if you're a Yankees fan or whatever. But if I go buy a 24 case of water at Costco or BJ's or Target, and then I go stand outside of Fenway Park or Yankee Stadium and I sell it bottle by bottle, right? That's all that we're doing with short-term rentals. I'm taking a property instead of selling it by the case or by the year, I'm just selling it off by the night. That's it. So by doing that and by breaking it up and selling it by the night, you by default make more money. 
It's honestly that simple. So here's a quick case study of a property. This was one of the first properties that I took over as a manager or co-host. Uh, this is a essentially a two family. So the owner lives in this front unit, beautiful brick building. And in this back side, there's a little one bedroom apartment back there that he was renting out for two grand a month. I said it's a two bedroom, but it's really like a one bedroom that we converted to a two bedroom. So I told John, I changed his name in this case, but I told John, if he paid to furnish it, I could run it and get him an extra 500 bucks a month after he paid me, paid the cleaning, everything. Like net, net, he could make an extra 500 a month. So he spent 10 grand to furnish this place and I took over the management of it. And this is a couple months old, but this is the exact property report that I gave him in August. So that property brought in $7,073.78 in gross revenue. The cleaning fees were $808.50. My fee was $1,600 and 16, uh, 16, 16 and 32. Uh, the expense reimbursements, which are essentially the supplies like toilet paper, you know, we put out a bottle of wine and chocolates and all that kind of stuff was 117. So he netted 4,500 bucks that month. I made 1600 and everybody was happy. Now that's August. Let's take a look at say like April was probably one of the slowest months. It's kind of like a, probably the same in Connecticut, right? It's like that sloshy, like wet, nasty month. Not all the people traveling. So in April, he did 43.52 in revenue. Again, my management fee was still 9.54. Net net, he made $2,533. Now you might not be able to see it, but I highlighted over here the average occupancy rate in this market for April was 37%. We did 81%. So there's a formula here that I kind of, I'm going to show you guys of how we are quite frankly crushing our competition in every market that we're in. And we're able to maintain consistent cash flow every month. So let me just show you. So that was one of the first ones. Then I repeated the system. Okay, this is another property. Owner netted forty three twenty five. I did about a thousand bucks that month between reimbursements and management fees. This one is in North Carolina that we launched a few months ago. Now I have two in North Carolina. Again, this property was actually sitting vacant. The owner unfortunately had some health issues and is going through a bunch of different treatments. So he asked me if I could rent out his house for him, and I said absolutely. You know. I'm happy to. Um, so I rented it out for him, made him 2,500 bucks on a property that was literally sitting there doing nothing in the middle of nowhere, uh, North Carolina. Uh, my mom, I told you guys I retired my mom. So my mom worked at Macy's and Nordstrom the majority of my life, just working retail, not making a lot of money. She works insanely hard. Uh, you know, blue collar family. My dad's an elevator guy. He works three different jobs. And uh, I told them, I said, if you pull a loan from your 401k and buy the property next to me in New Hampshire, I could, I could net you enough that you wouldn't have to go to work anymore. So they did. They bought the condo right next to us. This is the exact check I stroked to my mom uh, in November, a couple months ago. And my mom has not needed to, she quit her job at Macy's and like, just, she just chills now. And she watches my son every single week. So my brother and sister-in-law, they live in Atlanta. I love them. They just bought this badass beach house in Florida that I rent out for them. And we, went, we all went down there. I should have put a photo in. We all went down there for Thanksgiving as a family, my parents, them, my wife, my son, and my in-laws. And I had Thanksgiving at their beach house. And then I started teaching other people how to do it. All right, this is Steph. She's in Montreal. She was able to launch her first Airbnb within a week of me working with her. And uh, now she's, this was a while ago. I think she's up to four or five listings now. So the question that I get from most people though, is like, how was I confident that that property would make that owner more money, right? Like how was I, how did I know that I could take him from two grand a month to 2,500 plus? And it's simple. I'm a data junkie, right? I'm sure they teach you that in fortune builders. You need data. Like it's like, you got to figure out what the market will bear. And fortunately, you guys are going to want to write this down. It's a site called airdna.co, airdna.co. And what airdna does is it pulls all of the actual historical data from Airbnb and HomeAway from the last 12 months, 
and you plug in your address and it'll tell you, oh, based on, your, based on the last 12 months and your comparable properties, this property should do X amount in revenue. It would, average nightly rate would be this and the occupancy rate would be this. So when I ran the numbers on that property, it spit out 41,000. So in my head, if he's making two grand a month or 24,000 a year, there is plenty of margin between 24 and 41 for me to get paid and for him to make more money, right? So it's just basic math. So you can use a site like this, which is totally free. This report is free. You can buy like the actual market report and get more thorough data. But if you just do want to do a quick analysis on some of your properties, you're good to go. Uh, let's see what else we got. Does that you guys make, does that make sense for everybody before we keep going? Just give me a nod. Yep. All right. Absolutely. Cool. So that's the first piece, right? The three different models. And so the way that I scaled my business, just to recap was through that management model. I didn't have cash. So I just started keep, kept going to, to meetups and meeting landlords and just basically pitching them on this business model. Then eventually I started getting a track record and one turned into two, turned into four, turned into five, turned into 17. And now we're on track to be at 27 by the end of next month. So secret number two, okay, this is another huge objection that people have. How to make money on Airbnb even if you don't live in a big city or a vacation town, okay? First off, there's a ton of properties on Airbnb. And there are 1.4 million new people sign up every week to book an Airbnb for the first time. So let that sink in. 1.4 million people sign up every week to book an Airbnb for the first time. That is ridiculous. Like the demand is insane for this model. On any given night, 2 million people are staying in an Airbnb across the world. Airbnb's total number of listings is higher than the top five major hotel brands combined. And Airbnb counts half a billion guest arrivals and hosts earning $65 billion in host revenue. And that was as of March. So I don't know what that number is now, but the truth is there's plenty of demand. So if you felt like, oh man, am I late to the party? No, there's still plenty of demand out there for the foreseeable future. Now, what about regulations? Okay, here's a simple answer for you. Just Google short-term rental laws and then insert your city name. Okay, that's it. If you don't find anything, call up city hall and just say, hey, are there an, is there a permitting process? Are there any regs? Just let me know. Some of the most common ones that I see are you need to have a board of health inspection. They want to get in there, make sure the place is looking good. Like a lot of traditional 12 month lease rentals. Uh, some of them put restrictions that you need to have an owner occupied unit. So in the example I showed you, it was a two family, the owner lived in one side and then he Airbnb the other side. So that's been a lot of my bread and butter is finding, um, for lack of a better word, house hacking landlords that live in one of their units in a three family. And then I rent out the other two. So the other thing that I would suggest, okay, I do not operate in Boston at all. I would not attempt to operate in New York city. If you guys are close to New York city, my model has been, I go find a major city hub and then I go about 10 to 25 miles outside the major city. So like Boston, I don't play in Boston. I'll go, the property I showed you guys was in Salem. So I'd go a half an hour outside of Boston and it's way more lenient than if it's directly in the major city. Because a lot of these major cities like New York, Boston, Jersey City, San Francisco, they have you know, a lack of housing. So they look at folks like myself as taking inventory off the street, or at least that's how the hotel lobbyists play it. So for me, I don't even bother going to those cities. I'll go 30, 35 minutes outside and we'll crush it all day. So like that North Carolina property, it's about 15 to 20 minutes outside of Asheville. I don't, I don't play in Asheville. I go about 20 minutes out. So let me take a closer look at that Salem property for you guys. So, so for those of you that don't know the area, Salem is known for the witch trials. Okay. It's like a big Halloween touristy spot, but there's not much else really going on there. Um, so I was curious, like, what else would make this a good area for short-term rental guests? Okay, so you've got Boston way up here in the top left. Salem is way down here. That property's in the green way down here. Okay, so 
a couple other things that you'll notice, okay? It's right above it, there's a train into Boston. So it's like a four minute walk to the train station. That's a 30 minute ride into the major city. So it's easy access into the major city if they want. It's within walking distance to like the downtown area with all the bars and restaurants, walking distance to all the museums and all the witch trial stuff. But there's also a pretty decent sized hospital and a state university in that city. So there's a lot of different factors why people travel. And we hit on a few of them just in this market. You've got a university, you've got a hospital, you've got uh, access to a major city, you've got local bars and restaurants. And quite frankly, a lot of people are just traveling because they're going back home and visiting family. So I wanna recap and break down the nine different traveler profiles. Like why do people actually travel? Okay, number one is vacationing. That one's pretty obvious. Number two is corporate travel. Companies booking Airbnb for business now, there's over 700,000 companies that use Airbnb for work. And that was as of a year and a half ago. I'm sure that's gone substantially higher than that. Okay, and these are just some clips from guests that we've had. Uh, you've got medical, okay. I told you guys that there was a hospital nearby. So you've got traveling nurses, you've got uh, specialty doctors, like some of the, I don't know the technical term, but like the lung specialists that were looking at my son, like they were flying them in from Hopkins and all over the place and they need a place to stay. So if you're near the hospital, you've got patients that are there for weeks at a time, got traveling nurses, traveling professionals. So it's just a, a hub for short-term rentals. You've got academic, okay? So if you're near a university or some type of trade school or like cosmetology or like beauty school, any of those things, a lot of them are like 13 week programs. So people come in and they, if they're gonna stay in a hotel for 13 weeks, it's gonna cost them an arm and a leg. They'd rather go there with a couple of colleagues and split the cost and stay at an Airbnb. So which of these guests could you serve? I only put four of them in here. There's some more, there's, you know, um, military bases, there's life events, you know, unfortunately, you know, things happen. You've got fires, you've got floods, you've got houses that burn down. You know, we had an incident with uh, the gas company over pressuring some pipes and, you know, some houses, they had to shut the whole city down. So like there's different things that can also happen, but if you could be anywhere near one of these four, you're going to be golden. And I guarantee if you look within a 30 minute radius of where you are, you'll find at least one of these. Unless you live in the middle of nowhere, it's possible. So which of these guests could you guys serve? And quite frankly, who, which would you want to serve? So many people feel like, oh, well, I have to cater to everyone so that I can fill my properties. No, you don't. We furnish our properties. You know who I want to serve? I want to serve families and couples like me. I want to serve People that have little kids, I can accommodate. All of our properties have pack and plays, high chairs, strollers, kids books, kids games. They attract a certain demographic. It's that simple. Somebody that's looking for a party house, they're not gonna be attracted to most of our properties because they're like, I don't want a, a bedroom that has bunk beds. Like, why would I want that? Like, or a crib, you know what I mean? It just, it's all how you, if you know who you're trying to attract, it becomes very easy to furnish the properties appropriately. So the last piece is how to run a massively profitable short-term rental in less than four hours a week. Short-term rental business, not just one property, but multiple properties. All right, so the key difference here, this was like the big realization that I had when I shifted from a side hustle to an actual business. Okay, the key difference, a side hustle requires you to trade time for money. Okay, if I wasn't working, I wasn't making money. When I was side hustling and I was answering all the messages and I was coordinating cleanings and I was doing all this stuff, like that was a side hustle. Once I created systems and had a team, then it became a business because this business is running right now. We just had an issue with a guest in Texas that the team is handling while I'm doing this. Like I don't have to be at my phone all the time, okay? So systems, without them, you will always trade time for money. I don't care if it's with the Airbnbs. I don't care if it's flipping. I don't care if it's rental properties. I don't care if it's whatever, an Amazon e-com business. It doesn't matter. If you don't have systems and people, you have a job, plain and simple. So there are four systems that you need to run a massively profitable short-term rental business in less than four hours a week.
The first one is pricing. The second one is access and security. The third one is guest communication. And the fourth one is turnover management. So first one, dynamic pricing. All right, so with dynamic pricing, what you want to do is, if you ever noticed, like you go to book a flight somewhere, and then you check it the next day and it increased or decreased or whatever, it's because they're using a dynamic pricing tool. It's all that we're doing. Same thing with hotels. So instead of me trying to figure out, oh, Beyonce's in town next week and then the Sox are playing the Yanks the following week, I should probably charge more. I use a pricing tool that has algorithms and factors in everything that's going on in the market and adjust my prices accordingly to maximize my occupancy. So this all happens. I could not compute the amount of data that this thing does in order to price my property for maximum occupancy. So one, turning your pricing over to a dynamic pricing software will save you an insane amount of time. And then once a week, I check on Monday mornings, I look, I see what's my occupancy for the week and I might make a couple tweaks and then I'm good. The second one is access, okay? You do not want to be dealing with giving guests keys and running over to properties and doing all that. So we use certain Wi-Fi locks that integrate directly with Airbnb, HomeAway, Booking.com, all of them, so that when a guest reservation comes through, it automatically creates a unique code for that guest that uses the last four digits of their phone number, and it automatically messages that code to the guest. And it only works from 4 o'clock on check-in day to 11 a.m. on checkout day and then it automatically expires. So I don't have to go deal with handling keys, I don't have to go with changing locks, I don't have to change the keypad codes, it does it automatically. So we've got pricing, we've got access, and now the biggest one is security, okay? The biggest concern that any of your landlords or partners have is are you going to take care of my property and are you gonna pay me on time? The biggest fear that people have with Airbnb is, oh my God, somebody's gonna throw a party in my house and my place is gonna get trashed. Okay, so we have a four-step system that we use. The first is we do, not have, we, we do not have instant booking turned on. So basically, if someone wants to stay at our place, they have to send us a message and say, okay, uh, hi, my name's Christopher. I am coming to stay at your place with my wife and my two kids. It's just going to be the four of us. We're going there for blah, blah, blah. They have to have a completed profile with a verified email address, phone number, government issued ID, and have at least one positive review from another host. And then we feel comfortable. So it's like essentially screening a guest. Now, the second piece that we already talked about is using the Wi-Fi lock. So nobody ever gets a physical key. So nobody could ever go back to the property and get access when they're not supposed to be there. The third is we put ring security cameras on the outside of every property. So when the guests get there, Christopher in this case, you got Chris, his wife, and his two kids. I know it's just the four of them, and we're good to go. Now the last piece is, well, how do I make sure that they don't, you know, like make a bunch of noise and disturb a bunch of neighbors, okay? It is a piece of technology called noise aware, okay? It's a little sensor about the size of this box or a mouse and it plugs into an outlet and it, all it does is measure noise levels. You see the bottom of the screen here? This is a reading that just shows me, it just measures decibels. So if this thing spikes over this line in the middle here, between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m., I get a text message immediately. So if it goes off, it's happened maybe four or five times in the last two years, I simply, send the guest a message or I pick up the phone and I call them and I say, Hey, Christopher, hope you're having a great time. Thanks again for staying with us. I don't want to uh, be the party pooper, but I just got a complaint from one of the neighbors. And as you agreed, our house rules are quiet hours are 10 PM to 8 AM. So I'm going to have to ask you guys to quiet down a little bit, or we're going to have to have somebody from our team escort you off the property. And every time they're like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like I didn't realize like we were making so much noise, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So this four-step system, you know, you hear horror stories of a party going on. I would know immediately if that was happening. And I have boots on the ground that I could send there if I had to, or worst case scenario, if I had to call the cops, I would know immediately. Like there's, 
There's no way around it. And it's such a simple system. So four pieces to that system, screening your guests, quote unquote, screening your guests, the Wi-Fi locks, the ring security camera, and the noise aware sensor. Guest communication. Okay, if you do not have a system for guest communication, it will bury you. Especially as you scale beyond one, two, three listings, just the volume of messages that go out is mind numbing. Okay, so we use, again, software that integrates directly with Airbnb, homeawaybooking.com, and it basically centralizes all the messages and it automates them going out. So they get a booking confirmation, they get all of the house information that goes out automatically. They got, we automatically send a check-in like four hours after they get there. Hey, how's it going? Is everything up to your standards? We want to give you a five-star experience, blah, blah, blah. So all of the communication gets automated. You can see a screenshot. This is from a while ago of all the messages that went out to different guests at different properties that we did not have to send. So I haven't checked the stat in a while, but I know back when we had like six or seven properties, the total number of messages that went out was like 4,000 something in a, in a month. And that was with seven properties. We're at 15 now and we're going to be at 27 next month. I don't even, it's got to be over 10,000 messages a month that go out. So if you don't have a guest communication system, this becomes a job. And our new system that we have comes with a 24 seven team, basically a team of virtual assistants that respond night and day. So while I'm sleeping, if somebody gets locked out somehow, we have a team that they can call and we're good. Like we don't have to worry about it anymore. So we have 24 seven around the clock coverage. So I don't have to sit here waiting by my phone. Like, Oh God, is anything crazy going to happen? And the last system is turnover or cleanings. Okay. So again, we use a system. It integrates directly with all the major platforms where when we get a booking, it notifies our team of cleaners. We usually have two to three per geographic region, uh, two to three teams. We'd like to have backups. So the first team to go in and accept the booking on the platform, they get that cleaning. If they reject it or they don't you know, accept it, the next team gets dibs on it and then they can accept it. So we have backups on backups on backups. And then we get all the notifications. So they accept the job, we get notifications. When they get to the property, they each have their own unique passcode. So I can confirm whether they're at the property or not using my phone. I can see if it was them that unlocked the door. And then I could see if it was them on the ring camera. And then they have to send me time, time stamped photos or they send my team time stamped photos once the property's clean. And that's pretty much it guys. So when the pricing gets automated, the guest communication gets automated. Uh, the access gets automated and the cleanings get automated. Are you guys starting to see like this business becomes really easy and dialed in? Like it's 95% automated. The only thing that I'm honestly doing at this point is adding new properties and I'm starting to shift. I used to, but I'm starting to shift responsibilities to my assistant to order supplies. And we just order supplies either to the property or to the cleaner's house or to the local Target or Walmart and the cleaner goes and picks it up and restocks it. So like we, we don't even go there. I mean, I, I physically can't go to Texas on a monthly basis to go like restock supplies, right? Like that wouldn't make any sense. So with the right systems, the right team, this business is super easy. And basically I achieve my why, right? Like I don't need to trade time for money. I get to do stuff like this, which I love doing and sharing this with people. Like you can do this too. It's not that hard. So this is what we covered guys. First is how to profit from short-term rentals without any money or owning a single property, how to make money on Airbnb, even if you don't live in a big city or a vacation town and secret number three, how you can run a massively profitable short-term rental in less than four hours a week. So let me ask you guys a quick question. Who thinks this would be a great business for you guys to start in 2020? Who is interested in getting into Airbnb in 2020? Okay. Who thinks it would be way easier and faster if you did it with me personally? Yes, probably. Correct. So I'm not going to get into a pitch or anything. I want to answer you guys' questions tonight, but I do have a full-blown coaching program. We've got over 130 students from around the world. If you're looking for Get Rich Quick, first and foremost, like don't even contact me. Like I hate that. Yes, I have a great system, but you still have to do work. I'm not going to do it for you, and I don't want to 
quite frankly, I don't want to hang out with people that are lazy and don't want to put in the work. Like I just don't. So if you're interested, you can book a call with me at the link below. I'll have Dwayne repost it. I'll send it to him. But a couple things that I just want to share from some of my students before we get into questions. So Holly, this is probably my favorite story of any of my students. So Holly took the business model and took the whole hospital theme and she essentially furnishes properties for kids that are getting long-term treatment. So she has all of these properties surrounding hospitals in Canada that are like themed and she'll have like Cinderella come to the properties for the kids. And like, she, like what she's doing is freaking amazing. It's absolutely amazing. She calls it Holly's Homes. You guys can Google it and look her up. She's unbelievable. But she's been with me since like May and she's on unit number like 13 or 14 now. She's just exploded with this business. Uh, Brad and Jamie, they live in Virginia and they just purchased their home uh, vacation rental in Disney uh, that they get to go to a few times a year now and they just rent it out when they're not there and they're doing great. Uh, Edna, she is a total badass. She's got like six or 700 apartments up in Canada and she started switching to this model. She's got nine units live now. Um, she's starting to convert more of her portfolio over because the cash flow is just ridiculous. Uh, Danny is 22, recent college grad, has no work experience. Uh, he has a job, but he wanted to get into this business. And this is actually unbelievable. I mean, no prior experience, but he went out and got two listings from this owner. No money into these deals, got him up and running. And now this kid is making passive income at 22 years old with a full-time job. I love this story. Chris and his wife, they bought a little cottage on Hampton Beach. And um, I thought this was pretty cool. The guy that they bought it from, he had been running it as a vacation rental for years. And year one, after implementing what we were teaching, they beat that guy's revenue by over 50%. So again, if you guys are interested, I want to answer all your questions. You can book a call with me. It's not with a team. It's with me. You're going to talk to me. We'll have a video call. I want to figure out like, what is your why? Why do you think this is a good fit for you? And then I'll tell you a little bit more about the program and what that looks like. Sound good? Is that fair? All right, cool. So who has questions about Airbnb and short-term rentals? I went quick guys. I wanted to save some time for questions. So I was like flying through that stuff. Oh, not that. What was the? Um... All right, you can all mute. Right, each person can all mute yourself. Um, let's see here. Anybody have any questions? Say, so, um, so you said, um, I know, uh, you said your first couple were they through the RIA or they were. Have you ever did anything that's outside of uh, any investor groups, like sent out any letters or just approaching? Yeah, for sure. So the first two that I got, or the first one I got was off of Craigslist. I just reached out to a landlord. And um, interesting, I would, I, my initial thought was, this is going to be really hard because he was an older investor, like in his mid-60s, kind of old school guy. And um, he bought right into it. Now I got two properties from that guy. Um, so I got that one off of Craigslist. I have an office in this co-working space. So I'm around other entrepreneurs all the time. So I'm just meeting people, just telling them what I do. So quite frankly, guys, just networking, uh, hitting up Craigslist, going to investor meetups. There's not a lot of people that do what I do and what my students do. So if you go to a big meetup, everybody's either a flipper or a wholesaler or a buy and hold person, right? So if, if they go, if I go in there and like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm the Airbnb guy. And they're like, oh, really? There's not a lot of people that say that when you go into a meetup of 100 people, right? So it, it's such a niche that it's quite frankly really easy to stand out. So it's just telling people what you do. Like anytime I'm taking an Uber, I'm like, hey man, like how you doing? Like what are you up to? Like just talking Airbnb. Like everybody I talk to, I'm always talking about what I do. And it's just when you build that muscle, when you build that habit, it just becomes really easy. 
Uh, it's like, so for like a two, two bedroom or one bedroom, what are you telling the landlord what the, the budget for, for furniture? Cause are, are you getting like, uh, like bed and, 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 um, we do everything. Yeah. So we'll do everything. So I would say for a two bedroom, we tell owners between 12 and 15,000 and we charge a design fee now. Like before we would just do it at cost. I would just eat that cost, but now we charge a design fee for our time. Plus we charge for uh, contractors to build it out. I used to build all the furniture. I don't do it anymore. Um, so I would say between 12 and 15 for a two bedroom. If you guys are going to do it yourself, you could do it for 10. So I talk about like bay, talk about a kitchen table and all that. Everything stuff. like take it, you're furnishing a two bedroom house, two bedroom apartment, everything from the silverware to the bath mat, to the soap dispenser, to the fire extinguisher, to the locks, like everything soup to nuts. Everybody always likes to think about like couches and TVs, but there's all these little things that just add up like three sets of sheets and towels and makeup remover wipes and soaps. And just, we have a giant checklist that we just follow. And then how that conversation go where, you know, some landlords are apprehensive, like, Oh, I got to rent, I got to furnish it. And then we got to get this on Airbnb. Are you presenting the air DNA analysis to them and say, this is the numbers. You invest yes. 12, 15 K. This is how much you're going to net out or you know, your first month or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. So let's just do this. Let's say it's, let's say it's 15 grand. Okay. But I can make them an extra 500 a month. Okay. So we'll do six divided by 15. That's a 40% cash on cash return. All right. So it's all how you present it. Right. So I will say, okay, yep. I totally understand. It's definitely an investment. But if I could make you an extra 500 a month, that's six grand a year. That's a 40% cash on cash return. Are you getting a 40% return anywhere else in the market right now? And I don't say condescendingly. I just, I'm genuinely curious. Like if they are, I want to know because I want to know where I could put money to. So, um, you know what I mean? So when you come from that place, it's, it's all just how you present it. It's just like, hey, if, uh, you know, would you want to do this? And, and you also got to be confident, right? Like if I'm like, Hey, I think it's going to work. You know, if you want to put up 15, I, th I'm, I think it's going to work. No, I go there. I have two things that I bring to every appointment. I bring the air DNA printout, like I showed you guys. And I also bring, um, I basically have like a one page, a one pager that spells out that four step system that I showed you guys, the locks, the ring, all that because that's their other big concern. They're like, okay, cool. I can make more money, but it sounds like my property is, you know, getting rented out to Jim Bellucci every week. Right. Like that's, that's their concern. So I just bring those two pieces and I, I walk them through and get them comfortable. And they're like, Oh, well, this guy's a real deal. Like he's got a system. He's not just a fly by night kind of guy. Anybody else? Terrence, uh, Sandra, you any questions? What do you guys think? Oh, I got another. I'll, I'll, I'll keep. I'll, I'll get the juices rolling for you guys. So. I think Terrence, Terrence was trying Terrence, to talk, yeah, but Terrence, you're ahead. muted. Go ahead, Terrence. So I was asking how you locate your cleaning staff in terms of. Yep. Yeah. So the one of the apps that we use actually has a marketplace for cleaners, and I'll just tell you guys. I usually don't tell this in the webinars, but if uh, one of them is called Turnover B and B. So if you write that down, Turnover B and B, you can plug in the address, put in the number of bedrooms and bathrooms. And there's a pool of cleaners there and they're all rated. So like my cleaners would have been on there and I would have rated them a five star. So then when other people post like, Hey, I'm looking for bids then they submit bids. I can phone interview them. I can read through all the reviews. And then I simply add them to like my bench of staff and then they'll start to get the notifications. I think you're muted again. If you're saying something, Terrence. I think that answered your question though. So that, that's a good resource. Um, I've, I've pretty much done it all. That's my, always my first go-to and I've usually have good success with that. Um, I've also used Craigslist. I've used indeed, you know, some of the traditional ones, but turnover B and B if you're in anywhere where there's a decent amount of people that that works pretty good. So. That's for justice for the cleaners. 
uh, and as far as kind of like the the uh, you putting out the the what's that the air DNA rental analysis. So like when you say, all right, this is the market you want to be in 25, 30 miles outside of the city. Are you going through the air DNA? I was kind of playing around with it a couple of weeks ago. And are you choosing locations or choosing pockets of areas? Because you I mean not every 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 property may end up being a short a good a good short term rental. Yeah, for sure. So the first thing that I do is I plug the address into AirDNA. If I don't have any properties and I'm just like scouting a market, I'll do this, like, like what I was showing you guys. I'll just look at a map of the city and I'm like, what is there? Like what would draw people to travel to that market? Can I get close to this hospital? Can I get close to this university? I, one of the other properties I showed you guys is like right over here. So like, can I get over here? Yeah. Can I, this one's primo because I'm close to the train station. I'm close to the restaurants. I'm close to all the museums. Like this is this plus it's like a historic district. This is like where you want to be at in this city. So you just got to learn like where, where are the hotspots in your city? But even before you get there, I always ask my students, like, who do you actually want to serve? Like, who would you want to serve? And then it becomes easy. Like if I want to serve families, and couples, okay, couples, they want to go out on a date night. They want to be close to like the downtown area, right? Families, we've got all the local attractions here. Like, you know what I mean? Like if I wanted to serve nurses, okay, cool. Make sure I'm over near the hospital. But if you, if you have at least three of those, quite frankly, if you had two of those items that I was listing, you're golden. The other thing too that somebody taught me when I was getting started was the Burger King effect, right? If you look anywhere where there's a McDonald's, look across the street. McDonald's spends a stupid amount of money on market research and then Burger King just waits and then they buy a lot across the street. So see where the hotels are popping up. If there's a new hotel, they've spent a lot of money on the market research. It's a pretty good sign that there's demand for short-term rentals. That's it's just like one little cheat right there. And you're doing your trying to through, through Wayfair or are you going to uh, other, other places? Uh, we have a mix. So part of our program is we have like a, like a checklist and then I have like a done for you Amazon shopping cart for like all the essentials. And now my wife is actually designing stuff for the students because we do give Wayfair so much business that we get like 25 to 50% off because I've done so many projects with them. So, um, that's who we work with quite a bit. We've tested out some others. None of them are perfect. I'll be totally honest with you. So they all drive me nuts because they always send the wrong stuff or whatever. But um, when you have the, when you have the team in place, like the North Carol, one of the North Carolina properties that we just launched last month, I never went and saw the property. I never picked up a hammer. I never, I have yet to go there. Like, but it's completely built and launched and producing income. Wow. So like, I, I've never even been there. So like, you can do this completely remote um, just by following the system. So hopefully that answers your question. I see somebody in the chat said, do you Airbnb multifamilies? 100%, yes. 100%. I was talking to, um, I was talking to, I don't know if you guys know Joe Fairless, but I was talking to him yesterday. Um, and just basically seeing this trend where you're, I've, over the next three to five years, you're going to see a lot of these like newer class A apartments allocate like 5% of their units as short term rentals because the cash flow is way too good to not do it. Everybody's looking for like a value add type of deal. Here's your value add. Like it's, it's simple. It's like, just furnish it and rent it out by the night instead of by the, by the year. And you can charge more. Like it's, it's, it's such a simple value add. The, uh, your, your, uh, your price, the pricing tool is that, that, um, um, goes up and down automatically or you still have to go in there. They'll give you suggestions and then you have to kind of 
it does it automatically and it pushes it out to all the platforms. Wow. And my system that I use now, you can't even buy it until you have at least 10 properties. So my students, I'm allowing them now to start onboarding their properties into my account so they don't have to wait, which is awesome for them. But now I can go in and say, all right, I want my prices to be 15% higher on booking.com or 10% higher on HomeAway. Just because the way that the fees are structured, Airbnb only charges me 3%, but VR, uh, VRBO and HomeAway charge me 15. So I want my rates to be a little bit higher on those platforms. Booking.com, there's a lot more complexity that goes in with them. So I just charge 15% more on booking.com. So, you know, that I, having the right tool for the job is crucial. Like you can spend so much time just tinkering, pricing and doing all these different things. But again, my goal was to build a business that did not need me to trade time. Like that was it. I'm sure I could make more money if I was like dialed in 50 hours a week on this thing. I'm sure I could, but that wasn't my objective. Okay, we've got another, another question on the board. Yeah, Alex, the can you share some horror stories? Yeah, I will. Um, so probably a month after we launched that New Hampshire property, I rented out a last minute booking to a group of college kids and they were wanted one night. They were passing through, they were on a ski trip. They were literally going to be in my property from like 10 at night till eight in the morning. Like that was it. They needed a place to crash on their way up to Vermont. And I'm like, eh, I don't know, whatever. It was like a Wednesday in February. The complex is pretty much dead during the week. There's not a lot of people up there. So I'm like, whatever. If they're loud, it's not going to be the end of the world. And this is like a month after I just dropped like 20, 25 grand into this place and launched it. And so they get there. I see them on the ring and they're kind of rowdy. I see them carrying the 30 rack in. There's only six of them. So I'm like, all right, it's not a party. But, you know, I see them carrying the 30 rack in. I'm like, all right, whatever. Like, I know nobody's up there. They're probably going to be a little loud. It is what it is. I'm watching my noise aware sensor like peaking all night. It's sending me the notifications and I'm just ignoring them. Right. My system is working, but I'm just blatantly ignoring it. The next morning I wait and I'm seeing that they're checking out. And then I can see on my phone that the door is left open. Like it says door ajar. And I see them leave. So I'm like, wow, they left the door open in the middle of a snowstorm. So my cleaners get there. Uh, there's like beer all over the walls. There's like wow. urine all over the bathroom floors. They had ripped the stairs off the bunk bed. Uh, it's just, it was just like gross and just like totally disrespectful. Right. So I put in a claim with Airbnb um, threatened to sue the kid, all these different things. You know, I, I think I got back like a couple hundred bucks from Airbnb or whatever. Fortunately, most of the issue was just, it was just dirty. So I just paid my cleaners extra money to like go through and sanitize the whole place. And then I went up and like fixed the, um, the bunk bed the next time I was up there. Like I just kind of like refabricated the metal for the, the stair, but you know, the lesson learned, quite frankly, was I had these systems in place for a reason. When I ignored them, I sealed my own fate. Like I should have called them out immediately and been like, guys, like I get it. You need a place to crash. Tone it down or I'm going to ask you to leave. I, sh I, sh I didn't even make the phone call. Right. And then after, you know, they were just totally disrespectful. And I was so pissed. Like I was so angry. Um, but I said, I'll never make that mistake again. Right. And I knock on wood. I have not had any other places get trashed. I mean, you get some messy guests, but I've never had anybody like just be blatantly disrespectful like that and like just trash a place. And, you know, that's why I always say like, I don't operate properties without these things. Like this is the, the noise sensor, the cameras, the locks. Like I just won't do the deal if, if the owner won't do this stuff, it's not worth it. Uh, yeah, on top, just to piggyback off of that, the homeowner has obviously homeowner's insurance. Airbnb has their insurance. Are you also getting renter insurance or any? 
Well, you're not, you not, don't have a lease on it, but. Um, not for my model, but if you are going to go that route, there's a company called Proper that I recommend. It's proper.insure. So as a homeowner, I have it on my condo in New Hampshire, but you could also get it if you're going to do the master leasing model, you can get like a blended renters policy. That's what they specialize in. It's for short-term rental hosts. So if you own it or if you're master leasing it, they have uh, policies for you. Okay, good. But the Airbnbs is pretty, pretty a um, adequate. Plus you have the homeowner and stuff. I would still get the homeowners. Yeah. Um, Airbnb is, <laughs> they, they're very heavy on the guest side. If you think about how Airbnb makes money, their primary job, whether I like it or not, is to keep guests happy. Right. If you think about it. So also for those of you guys that are familiar with hosting at all, a lot of people ask me like, why would you pay for a software when Airbnb has smart pricing? Okay. As an example, this just bit me in the butt the other day. Okay. I launched two listings in Everett by the new casino. I don't know if you guys know that area at all, but there's a brand new casino just outside of Boston and Everett. I just launched two oh, yeah. brand yeah, new, yeah, nice. completely renovated condos. They're sick. Three bedroom condo. And I was waiting for price labs to sink and I didn't block the calendar like I should have. And within that window, with smart pricing, somebody booked Boston Marathon weekend for like a buck 20 a night in a three bedroom house for the whole weekend when it should have been like 800 a night. <laughs> like their pricing is so off. Like it's not even close. Okay. So again, they're incentivized. They make money by getting more guests on the platform. So they'd rather take less per stay. We have more people on there. So if you think about what motivates them, it is not to maximize your profit. And I hate to break it to you like that. So do not use smart pricing through Airbnb. Um, and I, Dwayne, I, I apologize, but I get totally sidetracked. What was the original question that we we're getting after? Uh, I think I forgot. It was, I think it was about the, uh, the insurance, but you covered that. And then you know, we got the pricing and stuff. Uh, and as far as kind of like what you guys do, separate yourself, optimizing your list and you guys sending out professional photographer or. Um, 100%. Yeah. yeah. So we, <clears throat> there's a certain way that we write all of our listings. And I hired a guy that used to work at Airbnb to like teach us how to do this. Um, think of it like SEO for Airbnb. So there's a certain way that I write all of my listings and I, I had him do a lesson for all of my students on how to like write the listings and how to do different pricing adjustments. Um, but honestly, even without that, it's using a pricing tool because it's going to maximize your occupancy. Like I showed you guys some of the stats, like I crush that market averages every single month in every market. Like it's not even close because of the pricing, because of the design, like our places just look amazing. I never cheap out on photography. I pay more, I will find the best photographer in that market because it has to look amazing for the listing. That's the first thing everybody sees. It's the only way to stand out. And I will say, find a photo that pops, right? Like, so when I showed my New Hampshire place, when I took this photo, when I took this photo and posted it as like the cover of my Airbnb, I got like four bookings that night because if you think of it as you're scrolling through to like book a place, everybody's got like a picture of like a living room with a gray walls and a gray couch and like some throw pillows and they all look the same. And then you see this and you're like, bam, like it just catches your attention. So all of my listings, like I put like a bright, vibrant photo as a cover photo that just like pops your attention. The other thing that I do and they're, kind of like shying away from this. I don't know if I have it in here, but I'll put these little heart emojis on my listings out front. So it, <laughs> it kind of tricks people, but like, it's like a red heart emoji in my title. So it, people see it and they're like, Oh, I must've favorited this listing. So it's a little like Ninja NLP type of deal, but it works. So all of my listings start with that little like heart emoji. So, and it just like, Again, it just pops. It just catches your attention. So it's all these like little things that you just kind of learn over time that you just tweak. I'm constantly tweaking and testing and tweaking and testing. 
you know, right now I'm running different like promotional campaigns on booking.com and like figuring that out. And then after I've tested it for a few months, then I go back and I teach it to the students. Right. So I'm just, I just like learning. So I'm just constantly learning stuff and just teaching it back. It's friggin' awesome. So. Anybody else got any, any more questions? Terrence is looking at the list. Oh, somebody wants to see Everett. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen and pull that up just so I can show you. So we just launched this one uh, last week. And I got to log out. I've got like too many different accounts here. While I'm pulling that up, feel free, guys, if you have any other questions. And like the, the photos and all that, is, is that also part of the, the you know, the 10, 15K you're asking the landlord to put yep. into the property? Yep. It is indeed. And if they, if they come back and they try and cheap out on some stuff, I just... I used to just take it on and deal with it, but I don't do that anymore. I'm like, nope, like I don't even, you follow my system or you can find somebody else to handle your properties because it's just not worth it. I know I've done enough of these over the last few years. Like I know what's going to, what's going to work. So let me just pull this up so you can kind of get a, a feel for this. Stop share, new share. Desktop. Let me preview this. <laughs> this out of the way. So again, you want a couple tips for like writing a listing. Use bullet formats like this because people aren't going to read a lot of this, but that this will catch their attention. Okay, three minutes to Encore, which is the casino. 4K TVs. Five minutes to the shops at the train station. Parking. Right. And then for the photos, like we use bright, vibrant colors that just pop. The design pops, this photo pops, right? Like just aesthetically you find furniture, like the tea kettle in these chairs, that's like, boom, like pops of color. Get a sunset shot in there. But it, was this a, a, you said this was a new, a new building or a yeah. new unit? Yeah, total gut job, total rehab Wow. that we just launched uh, last week. This is the one that somebody got for 120 bucks a night Boston. for Boston Marathon weekend. So uh, any other questions, guys and ladies? No? All right. I'm going to throw this back up. I'll put that link back up in case you guys want to. Yeah, I'll make sure to send, book a call send with that, me. Gonna send that link out uh, to everybody in the replay. People who missed it today. I know we also have a lot of people, but you know, it's, uh, sometimes that happens. Yep. All good. All right, guys, anything else? I appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, sticking with me. Hopefully this was valuable. Hopefully you guys got some notes and um, hopefully it just piqued your interest a little bit. This is the coolest business model I've ever come across at real estate. And uh, I'm just super passionate with sharing it with people. So, Brother Mike, we really appreciate, appreciate your time again. Um, I know like I said, taking time out of your day, but you know, we really appreciate it on the early to kick off this 2020. And again, uh, folks, you guys want to reach out to me, I can shoot the information over to you guys, but I'll be sending this out in the in email so everyone has it. And uh, yeah, just give give Mike a ring, you know, uh, schedule a call, kick, kick cool. this thing off. All right, guys. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. All right, brothers and sisters, uh, have a good uh, rest of the, the week, and we'll be chatting with you. We'll Check the emails. Look out for the next meetup. We'd like to see you in person at the next one at Jamaican Kitchen on uh, first first Thursday next month. Uh, everybody's invited. We're gonna, we always have food and drinks and you know good vibes and you know people just trying to grow, trying to grow, trying to grow our money here.
All right, guys. Have an awesome night. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Good night, guys. Good night, guys. Take care. You too, sir. Yeah.